Well, uh, Gillian, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. It truly is a great pleasure uh, to be here at this truly remarkable uh, conference, this uh, feast of intellectual inquiry. But I do actually feel I face a bit of a challenge uh, this evening. Indeed, as I stand up to speak to you at 9.50, after a debate that started at 8 a.m., I feel that I am sort of a powerless cog within Rob Johnson's somewhat perverse experiment. <laughs> his, 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 his somewhat perverse experiment in group intellectual dynamics, because you may remember that last night, Rob explained to us, when he set out the timetable, he explained to us quite explicitly his philosophy of how to get good results from people. And, and he said, with no sense of irony, that first of all, you had to get everybody absolutely and utterly exhausted, and that then and only then, the debates and insights would begin to flow. So, after a day in which you have had 20, I counted them up, uh, meaty presentations, it is now my job to keep you going for ooh, another two or three hours, I guess. <laughs> but uh, in doing that, I have one advantage, which is I have a new angle. Uh, I, I speak not as an academic uh, economist, though I, I did study economics and teach it uh, briefly part-time here at Cambridge, but I've not been a full-time academic economist, but as a financial regulator. And George Soros, actually, earlier today, suggested a way in which regulators might enliven their contribution to any meeting. Since George said regulators were partly to blame, he said, and I quote, what we need is a bit of Chinese-style regulatory self-criticism. So I guess I should feel fortunate that I have not been put in a sort of set of stocks up here so that you can throw things at me while I make sure that I'm adequately self-critical. But I'm afraid I'm not going to provide that sort of entertainment, and I don't need to, because I do have a cast-iron alibi. I wasn't there. I joined, <laughs> as Gillian says, I joined the FSA on the 20th of September 2008, which was five days after Lehman's collapsed, and three weeks before we rescued the developed world banking system with trillions of dollars of public capital and liquidity. It, it was somewhat like being appointed captain of the Titanic shortly after we'd hit the iceberg, but a little bit before we sank. But, but, but while I'm not going to do Chinese-style self-criticism this evening, I do commit that in 10 years' time, if we do it all again and have another crisis, I will give you a self-criticism session uh, at that time because I will be subject to criticism because one of the things that I am trying to do with my time at the moment is work out what we have to do in regulatory reform to at least reduce the likelihood or the severity of it all happening again. And therefore, I am very much in the market for ideas from economics about how we understand what went wrong, and how we stop it happening again. Now, one assumption behind this conference and behind the establishment of the Institute is that one thing that went wrong was bad economics, or at least oversimplified uh, economics. A and broadly, I do share that view. I think there was a dominant conventional wisdom that markets were always rational and self-equilibriating, that market completion by itself could ensure economic efficiency and stability, and that therefore, axiomatically, financial innovation and increased trading activity were beneficial. And as warning signs of potential problems emerged, I think that conventional wisdom was used to dismiss concerns expressed by several commentators, used to dismiss, for instance, the concerns that Bill White was expressing in his reviews with the BIS, or the concerns expressed by, for instance, Raghu Rajan at Jackson Hole in 2005. So, in response to that apparent harmful influence of a dominant conventional wisdom, the Institute for New Economic Thinking has been established. And the proposition is that we do need a fundamental challenge to recent conventional wisdom. And I, I strongly endorse that proposition.
But success is not going to come easy because there were reasons why the recent conventional wisdom became so dominant. And the issues we face are complex ones to which there are no easy answers. And so I'd like, first of all, to make some comments about the allure of conventional wisdoms and the challenges of complexity before highlighting some key specific issues of financial regulation where new economic thinking is required. Let me begin in that with a caricature. For over half a century, the dominant strain of academic economics has been concerned with exploring through complex mathematics how economically rational human beings interact in markets. And the conclusions which have been reached are on the whole optimistic and in some cases panglossian. Kenneth Arrow, Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Brewer illustrated that a competitive market with a fully complete set of markets is Pareto efficient. New classical economists such as Robert Lucas illustrated that if human beings are rational, not only in their preferences and choices, but in their expectations, then the macroeconomy will have a strong tendency towards equilibrium with sustained involuntary unemployment, by definition a non-problem. And tests of the efficient market hypothesis illustrated that liquid financial markets are not driven by the patterns of chartist fantasy, but by the efficient processing of all available information. So that, as was quoted by someone earlier today, Farmer said that the actual price of a security will be a good estimate of its intrinsic value. And as a result of that set of propositions, a set of policy prescriptions appeared to follow. Macroeconomic policy was best left to simple, constant, and clearly communicated rules with no, rules, no role for discretionary stabilization. Deregulation was in general beneficial because it completed more markets and created better incentives. Financial innovation was beneficial because it completed more markets. And speculated trading was beneficial because it ensured efficient price discovery. And complex and active financial markets, this was the great thing, not only improved efficiency, but they also improved system stability since rationally self-interested agents would disperse risks into the hands of those best placed to absorb and manage it. Now, of course, as a description of academic economics, this is not only a simplification, but, but it is a caricature. Because throughout the last half century, much of academic economics has been devoted quite explicitly to understanding why and under what conditions these simplistic assumptions do not apply. Kenneth Arrow himself spent much of his career exploring the market imperfections which made his illustration of a Pareto efficient equilibrium non-applicable in the real world. Many researchers found all sorts of movements in financial markets, serial correlations and various other patterns uh, which contradicted simple efficient market hypotheses. All economic textbooks included taxonomies of potential market failure, which could justify policy interventions such as pollution taxes and provision of public goods. And more fundamentally, the work of uh, all three, I think it is, of the Nobel laureates here today, that were meant to be four, but Mike Spence hasn't turned up, but Mike Spence and Joe Stiglitz and James Merlis and George Akerlof, their work was acclaimed because it illustrated that once we really understand the implications of information economics, markets can settle far from efficient equilibrium and equilibria can be multiple and fragile. Meanwhile, the work of behavioral economists such as Danny Kahneman, of course, also awarded a Nobel Prize, questioned the very assumption of rational choice of a sort of homo economicus driven solely by the parts of his brain devoted to rational information processing. So the fact is that economics has not been monolithic. It has explored complexities and made its assumptions clear. It has produced multiple schools of thought and the most prestigious prizes have gone to a wide variety of people of strongly opposing views. And some of those views help us understand why the financial crisis occurred. So why, we might ask, do we need new economic thinking when old economic thinking has been so varied and fertile? And why, somewhat paradoxically, did we start on the opening dinner of the Institute of New Economic Thinking uh, with a session entirely devoted uh, to two economic thinkers who produced their work 70 or 80 years ago, Keynes and Hayek? 
What is going on here? Well, I think the reason why we need new economic thinking is that because the fact remains that while academic economics included many strains and was varied and fertile, nevertheless, in the translation of ideas into ideology and ideology into policy and business practice, it was one oversimplified strain which dominated in the pre-crisis years. Now, Keynes, of course, famously wrote that the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than commonly understood. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. He went on, of course, to talk about madmen in authority, and I, I've rather aspired to that status, but <laughs> not quite sure whether I've got there. But let's focus for the moment on the practical men uh, exempt from any intellectual influence. I actually suspect that the bigger danger lies not with entirely practical men or women exempt from any intellectual influence, but with the reasonably intellectual men and women who are employed in the policy-making functions of central banks, regulators, and governments, and in the risk management departments of banks, who are aware, quite consciously, of intellectual influences. They may well have discovered economics. They know something about the literature, but who tend to gravitate to simplified versions of the, domin the dominant beliefs of economists who are not yet defunct, but still very much alive. For I think it is striking that in the pre-crisis years, how dominant and how overconfident, at least in the arena of financial economics, was a simplified version of equilibrium theory which saw market completion as the cure to all problems and mathematical sophistication decoupled from philosophical understanding as the key to effective risk management. Institutions such as the IMF, in their global financial stability reviews, did set out a confident story of a self-equilibrating system. Thus, for instance, the April 2006 Global Financial Stability Review, only 18 months before the onset of the crisis, said as follows. There is a growing recognition that the dispersion of credit risks to a broader and more diverse group of investors has helped make the banking and wider financial system more resilient. This improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. Now, presumably the person who actually wrote those words has now been locked up in the cellar and is not allowed out uh, day by day. But what we do have there, what we do have there is a very clear statement of the idea that market completion helps create not only a more efficient but a safer system. Meanwhile, numerous speeches by Alan Greenspan enunciated a theory, indeed it was called by his followers not just a theory but a doctrine, that market completion via financial innovation was delivering both economic efficiency and stability. Risk managers in banks, meanwhile, applied the techniques of probability analysis to value at risk calculations without asking whether samples of recent past events truly did carry strong inferences for the probability distribution of future events. And in regulatory institutions such as the FSA, the assumption that financial innovation and increased market liquidity were valuable because they completed markets and improved price discovery were not just accepted, they were part of the institutional DNA. They were part of the belief system. When I took over at the FSA and read our internal and external documents on issues like the development of credit derivatives, arguments for and against short selling, was there speculation in the oil market, increased trading activities, the benefits of improved price discovery. Whether or not you think the conclusions we reached were right, what was startling was it was clear that there was a philosophy. There was a way of answering the questions which drew on a particular conventional wisdom. And it was clear to me that I had been appointed high priest of a particular religious cult. Now, this belief system did not, of course, exclude the possibility of market intervention, but it did tend to determine the appropriate nature and limits of intervention. Requirements for information disclosure to retail customers 
were appropriate, were recognized as appropriate, because it was recognized that there were asymmetries of knowledge between businesses and consumers, which information disclosure could help overcome. Regulation and enforcement to prevent market abuse was justifiable because it was clear that rational agents can also be greedy, corrupt, or criminal agents. And regulation to increase market transparency, well, that was not only acceptable, but was a central tenet of the doctrine, since transparency completes markets and helps generate increased liquidity and price discovery. But the belief system of market regulators and financial policymakers in the most financially advanced centers did tend to exclude the possibility that rational profit seeking by professional market participants might generate rent extraction and financial instability rather than social benefit, even though several economists had clearly shown why that might be the case. What the dominant conventional wisdom of policymakers therefore reflected was not a belief that the market economy was actually at a sort of arrow de bre nirvana, but the belief that the only legitimate interventions were those which sought to identify and correct those very specific market imperfections which you could identify were preventing the attainment of that nirvana. So transparency to reduce the costs of information gathering was essential, but recognizing that information perfections might be so deep as to be unfixable, and that some forms of trading activity might be socially useless, however transparent, was simply beyond the ideology. Uh, as a philosophy, it was, as it were, therefore, Stigler, but not Stiglitz. So, so what we have had is a varied and fertile academic e economics, which in translation to policy formulation became oversimplified and overconfident. Why did that translation occur? Well, Jagdish Bhagwati, in his famous foreign affairs article on the capital myth, talked of a Wall Street treasury complex, of the fusion of interests and ideologies. And he argued that both played a role in the process by which liberalization of short-term capital flows became an article of faith of the Washington consensus despite sound theoretical reasons for caution and slim empirical evidence of benefits. And in the wider triumph of the precepts of financial deregulation and market completion, both interests and ideology have clearly played an important role. Pure interests expressed through lobbying power were undoubtedly important to several key de deregulations in the US where political system and campaign finance rules are peculiarly conducive to the power of specific lobbies. And interests and ideology often interact in ways so subtle that it is difficult to disentangle them, the influence of interests achieved through an unconsciously accepted ideology. The financial sector dominates non-academic employment of professional economists who, however rigorously independent in their judgments on specific issues, will, because only human, tend implicitly to support, or at least not aggressively challenge, the conventional wisdom which is in the interests of their industry. Market efficiency and market completion theories can help reassure the top executives of major financial institutions that they must, in some subtle way, be doing God's work, even when... It even when it looks to the uninformed uh, observer as if some of their trading is simply speculation. Lobbying for regulatory change, which will make senior executives richer, is often most effective if led by executives who truly do believe that they are doing good, by do doing well by doing good. Regulators, meanwhile, need to hire industry experts to regulate effectively, but industry experts are almost bound to share the industry's implicit assumptions. Understanding these social and cultural processes which straddle the interest to ideology divide, I think is in itself an important area for research. But we should also, I believe, not underplay the importance of an ideology in itself, of a set of ideas complex and internally consistent enough to have intellectual credibility, but simple enough to provide a workable basis for day-to-day decision-making. Complex human institutions, such as those which together form the policy-making and regulatory system, are difficult to manage without guiding philosophies, and guiding philosophies are most compelling when they provide clear answers. 
a philosophy which asserts that financial innovation, market completion, and increased market liquidity are always and axiomatically beneficial simply provides a clearer basis for the decentralization of regulatory decision-making than one which teaches that innovation is sometimes valuable and sometimes not, depending on the market and depending on the specific circumstances. And here, I suspect, lies the greatest challenge for new economic thinking. For while the simplified pre-crisis conventional wisdom appeared to provide a complete set of answers resting on a unified intellectual system and methodology, really good economic thinking will provide multiple partial insights based on varied analytical approaches. Good economics is inherently non-monolithic. Take, for instance, the debate about the assumption of rationality. Should the new economic thinking accept or reject it? There has been quite a lot of discussion of that in the papers presented today. And indeed, it's a debate I've had several times with George Soros. I tend, perhaps a bit casually, to use the wording that one of our key challenges is that liquid financial markets are susceptible to irrational herd or momentum effects. And every time I say that, George picks me up and says, no, the volatile divergence of markets from equilibrium is the product of interactions between agents who are acting on an individual basis in a perfectly rational, self-interested fashion. And it's very clear that hugely important insights can be derived from the exploration of how information imperfections, skewed incentives, and imperfect principal-agent relationships can produce results far away from a Pareto efficient equilibrium, even if we assume full individual rationality. Both financial sector rent extraction and potential harmful volatility are compatible with individual rationality. But I think it is also valuable that behavioral economics, drawing on the insights of neuroscience and evolutionary biology, has pointed out to us that our human brains do include both areas devoted to the rational deliberative processing of information and areas where decisions clearly are made on immediate, instantaneous, instinctive, and emotional basis. And while financial bubbles can be explained by the interaction of rational agents, it is, I think, also insightful to ascribe a role for what Keynes labeled animal spirits or the delicate balance of spot spontaneous optimism or for confidence in the very specific way in which George Akerlof defined it earlier today to mean not just a point of view, but a trust in that point of view. And from Keynes too, we should take the insight that the theory of rational expectations breaks down not only because of specifically identifiable imperfections of information, nor even because people sometimes act in spontaneous emotional ways, but because the very idea that the expectations of economic agents are distributed around the objective probability distribution of future outcomes is a philosophical category error, since no probability distribution of future outcomes objectively exists. The future, and therefore financial markets which link the present and the future, being characterized by an element of inherent irreducible uncertainty. So if we ask the question, should new economic thinking explore the implications which would follow even if people were fully rational but operating within real world constraints? Or should it explore the role of instinct and emotion? Or should it recognize Keynesian inherent in irreducible uncertainty? The answer has to be all three. We need to recognize, as Adam Smith did in his theory of moral sentiments, and that was also mentioned this afternoon, that humans are part rational and part instinctive emotional. We need to accept that the economist must, as Keynes said, be mathematician, historian, statesman, and philosopher in some degree. Though I always have had that sneaking suspicion that when Keynes wrote that, he probably thought that there was only one person who would ever go <laughs> fully above that bar. <laughs> and we need to understand, as Mervyn King and others have put it in a recent paper, that because beliefs and behaviors adapt over time in response to changes in the economic and social environment, that quote, there are probably few genuinely deep and therefore stable parameters or relationships in economics, as distinct from in the physical sciences, where the laws of gravity are as good an approximation to reality one day as they are the next. Which I'm afraid is going to make doing and communicating new economic thinking rather hard. 
Because one of the key messages we will need to get across is that while good economics can help address specific problems and avoid specific risks and can help us think through appropriate responses to continually changing problems, good economics is never going to provide the apparently certain, simple and complete answers which the pre-crisis conventional wisdom appeared to. But that message is in itself very valuable because it should help guard us against any future ability to sweep away common sense observations of emerging risks with an assertion that theory proves that those risks have in some unseen way been effectively managed. But to be useful, new economic thinking must also help us address specific real world problems. And it's the real world problems of financial regulation that keep me busy at the FSA. And new economic thinking is needed to ensure that in our response to the financial crisis, we are adequately radical, addressing the fundamental drivers of instability, not just the symptoms. And one crucial question, which was posed to me originally by Tommaso Paduasciotto, is whether the crisis revealed problems in specific institutions and the incentives they face, or problems inherent within any system of credit extension, or problems inherent within, problem, within liquid financial markets. Do we, Tommaso asked me, did we face a crisis of institutions or a crisis of markets? Now, obviously, the crisis was in part one of specific, large, systemically important banks. And in response, there is an intense debate about the too-big-to-fail problem. Politically, that debate focuses on the costs of bailout and on tax devices designed to, quote, get our money back. For economists, the debate focuses on the moral hazard created by ex-ante expectations of bailout, which, if they exist, will reduce market discipline on excessive risk-taking. And numerous policy options to deal with this problem are now being debated. These include higher capital ratios specifically required for systemically important banks, more intense supervision, limits on trading activity in line with the Volcker rule, pre-designated resolution and recovery plans, and the use of taxes for Pigovian purposes rather than to get our money back for the purpose of internalizing externalities and creating better incentives. And I am certainly convinced that finding answers to the too big to fail problem is necessary. Indeed, indeed, it is the central issue being considered by one of the standing committees of the International Financial Stability Board, which, which I chair. But we must not confuse necessary with sufficient. And I think there is a danger that too exclusive a focus on too big to fail could divert us from still more fundamental issues. In the public's eye, the focus appears justified by the huge costs of rescue. But when we look back on this crisis in, say, 10 years' time, what may be striking is how small the direct costs of rescue will then appear. Many government funding guarantees will, at the end of the day, turn out to be costless because they won't be called. Central banking liquidity support provided at market or penal rates will often show a profit. Cast your eye over the annual accounts of the Bank of England for the last year, and you'll see that effect. Capital injections will be partially and sometimes wholly recovered when stakes are sold. Indeed, there may be some profits. Emerging estimates of the total fiscal costs of rescue vary by country, but are usually just a few percentage points of GDP. When the Obama tax levy to get our money back worked out what the money might be, the figure turned out to be $110 billion, which is, of course, only about two-thirds of a percent of U.S. GDP. But as a result of this crisis, UK and US government debt to GDP will likely rise by 40 to 50 percentage points. And the even more important measures of economic harm are GDP growth foregone, unemployment, and setbacks to already achieved individual wealth and income levels. Which illustrates that the crucial problem is not the fiscal cost of rescue, but the macroeconomic volatility induced by volatile credit supply first supplied too easily and at too low a price, then severely restricted. And I think it is possible, and indeed I suspect likely, that such problems of volatile credit supply could exist, would exist, even if the too big to fail problem were effectively dealt with. In the US, this crisis has seen significant over-exuberant commercial real estate lending by, real, by regional banks, which if they fail, 
will be resolved by the FDIC in the normal fashion and where that has always been the market's ex-ante anticipation. In the UK, similarly, we have had problems with mid-sized mortgage banks, poor commercial real estate lending by mutual building societies, as much as problems with two of our large banks. Ireland faces huge economic problems as a result of a commercial real estate boom driven by banks which by global standards are relatively small. And as Franklin Allen commented this afternoon, Spain has had an enormous economic bust but has two large banks which are among the soundest in the world. There is therefore a danger that focusing simply on too big to fail, we make it, as it were, a somewhat arbitrary totem pole of radicalism. You test how radical you are by deciding how, seeing how radical you are on the TBTF uh, problem. And indeed, I think there is a danger that an exclusive focus on too big to fail essentially becomes a new variant of the belief that if only we can identify and correct that crucial market failure, in this case, the moral hazard arising from too big to fail status, then fixing that, we will at last have achieved a stable and self equilibrating system and move onto the bright sunlit uplands of the Arrow de Bre Nirvana. If instead, fixing too big to fail is necessary but not sufficient, then the roots of credit volatility are deeper and the policy response may need to be more radical. The essence of the problem appears to lie in the specific characteristics of credit demand and credit supply. Hyman Minsky, in his distinction of hedge finance, speculative finance, and Ponzi finance, highlighted that in the exuberant phase, credit demand is significantly driven not by entrepreneurs seeking to finance new investment, which they will hope will generate profits high enough to service the debt, nor by householders seeking to smooth consumption across their life cycle in a sustainable fashion, but by companies and households using credit in the anticipation of short to medium term capital gain, primarily but not exclusively in real estate markets. That is what happens on the demand side. And that demand in turn is met in part by banks. And banks are evolved institutions which have developed as a result of historical processes with a very specific institutional form. With liquid resources very small relative to their short term liabilities, and with capital reserves very small relative to total assets. That combination, Minsky and others have argued, creates the potential for self-reinforcing cycles, which are not just one potential cause, but the essential cause of macro volatility, both in the upswing and in the downswing, and crucially, which could arise as much in a system of multiple small banks as in one of large, too big to fail banks. Now, of course, you can debate that view of the world. There are many complex issues there. But I, for one, find those arguments compelling, whether expressed by Minsky or, indeed, in a different variant by Axel uh, Leon Hufford and by Franklin Allen uh, this afternoon. And if this is where the fundamental problems lie, then radical policy implications follow along one or both of two dimensions. The first would entail imposing increases in bank system liquidity and capital requirements, which are not just large, but transformational, taking us back to the highly liquid and much less leveraged banks of the 1950s or the early half of the 20th century. Larry Kotlikoff, indeed, echoing Irvin Fisher, believes that a system of leveraged fractional reserve banks is so inherently unstable that we should abolish banks and instead extend credit to the economy via mutual loan funds, which are essentially banks with 100% equity capital requirements. Now, for reasons I've set out elsewhere in a recent lecture, I am not convinced by that extremity of radicalism. And even if we don't go that far, but we do require a revolution in bank capital and liquidity requirements, we would need to transition to them over very long time periods by which I actually mean decades rather than years, since if we start with an unsustainably leveraged system, rapid transition to a sound system will itself stymie recovery. Our resolution, as it were, of the conclusions that we draw from comparative statics and for transition dynamics needs to be Augustinian. Oh God, make us prudent, but not quite yet. But we do at least need to debate what the long-term aim should be. 
We need to ensure that the debates on capital and liquidity requirements address the fundamental issues rather than assuming that, that choices are only at the margin. And that requires economic thinking which goes back to basics and which recognizes the importance of specific evolved institutions such as fractional reserve banking rather than treating existing institutional structures either as neutral pass-throughs in economic models or as facts of life which we couldn't possibly change. The second policy response to this problem, either alternative or complementary, would be to use discretionary through the cycle policy tools to offset the risks of self-reinforcing credit and asset price cycles. This could entail the discretionary countercyclical variation of bank capital requirements and indeed might need to involve their variation by different credit category, given the very different elasticity of credit demand in different sectors of the economy using credit for different purposes. We may need limits specifically on commercial real estate lending to reflect the fact that across the board policy levers might well harmfully restrict credit to sectors of the economy which truly are involved in value creative investment long before they restrict, as it were, the Ponzi finance stage of a, the, the Minsky story. So we may need new tools to take away the punch bowl before the party get out of hand, and even perhaps new tools to enable us to take it away from the already drunk, but not from the still sober. All of which I think would take us, would clearly take us far away from the dominant conventional wisdom of the last several decades, where optimal results are achieved, provided financial regulators identify and correct specific market failures, while central banks use one instrument alone to pursue one unchanging inflation objective. But I think that is inevitably so, that we head towards those radical directions, given the huge and inherent pro-cyclicalities against which we need to lean. But finally, I think it is possible that our response to the crisis should reflect a still more radical analysis of the specific nature of financial markets and financial contracts, their inherent potential instability and potential for rent extraction. Uh, tests of the efficient market hypothesis, illustrating the absence of chartist patterns, were assumed by many devotees of the conventional wisdom to imply that markets were self-equilibriating and collectively rational. In fact, no such inference follows. As Richard Thaler has pointed out, proof that there is no free lunch does not prove that the price is right. And I think indeed it was Marcus uh, uh, Brunemeyer who reinforced that message this morning. And instead, there is a wealth of evidence, for instance, from Bob Schiller, that liquid traded markets can be subject to self-reinforcing herd and momentum effects. So I think the question is not whether financial markets are collectively subject to irrational exuberance and overshoot, but how much it matters and whether we can do anything about it. In credit markets, volatility surely matters a great deal. And while the recent crisis was partially one of classical banks making loans on balance sheet, it was also the first crisis of complex securitized traded credit. And the development of securitized credit and related credit derivatives was hailed before the crisis as a positive virtue, bringing to credit extension the great benefits of liquidity and price discovery. Thus again, the IMF's Global Financial Stability Review of April 2006 noted favorably that credit derivatives, and I quote, enhance the transparency of the market's collective view of credit risks and thus provide valuable information about broad credit conditions and increasingly set the marginal price of credit. But setting the marginal price of credit by reference to a liquid market in credit derivatives, rather than from independent credit analysis, is only economically valuable if one believes, in line with the efficient market hypothesis, that the market's collective view of credit risks is by definition correct. If instead, we note that CDS spreads for major banks fell steadily in the four years before the crisis to reach a historic low point in May 2007 and provided no forewarning at all of impending financial disaster, we should be worried that increasing reliance on market price information to set the marginal price of credit rather than relying on independent credit analysis could exacerbate credit supply and asset price volatility. 
So how far and under what conditions additional price discovery via the CDS market is actually economically beneficial must be an open issue. And I have concerns that credit extension entirely via Larry Kotlikoff's loan mutual funds could result in a credit extension just as volatile, indeed possibly more volatile than credit extension via banks, via banks. Because I think we would have falls in the mark to market value of those loan funds producing rushes of demands to take your money out of those loan funds, driving forced sales and producing sudden stops in the supply of new credit to the economy. So I am not convinced that our problems lie entirely on banks rather than more widely in the interface between credit extension and liquid traded markets. But more generally even, the idea that additional market liquidity supported by additional position taking or speculative activity is always and in all markets beneficial, which was one of the central articles of faith of regulators such as the FSA before the crisis, has to be challenged. Obviously, reasonably liquid markets clearly have some benefits, but those benefits must be subject to diminishing marginal returns. The benefits of algorithmic or flash trading, which provide price discovery in a fraction of a second rather than in two, three, or four sessions, must be at best minimal and arguably nil. And there are good theoretical reasons for believing, as Joe Stiglitz has set out, that financial trading activity can in some instances be zero sum at the social level, but profitable to individual players. As a result, attracting to financial activity more skilled resources than optimal, which might be better employed in other sectors of the economy. And any liquid traded market which overshoots, whether it be an equity market or an FX market, can produce resource misallocation or harmful macro volatility. Foreign exchange carry trades are, as far as I can see, of zero social value and potentially destabilizing. What follows from these insights, however, is not at all straightforward. If market liquidity is valuable up to a point but none beyond it, regulators may still have absolutely no ability to design regulation which helps us achieve just that marvelous point of optimal liquidity. If equity markets overshoot, that may result, certainly did result in misallocated resources, too many unnecessary dot-coms set up in the internet boom. But the macroeconomic consequences may be much less important than overshoots in credit markets, precisely because equity contracts are the flexible residual in the system. And if there is a misallocation of skilled resource to the financial sector, attracted by rent extraction opportunities, provided the scale is not too great, we may just have to accept it as we accept misallocations in other sectors of the economy. If new economic thinking rejects the idea that the market will naturally deliver a perfect equilibrium, it should equally be wary of believing that public policy can achieve it. But knowing that market liquidity, speculation and price discoveries is not limitlessly and always beneficial still implies a profound change of approach from the conventional wisdom which dominated in the pre-crisis years. It implies that we should take financial transaction taxes and short-term capital flow controls out of the index of forbidden thoughts. And it means that in debates about prudential risk controls, such as capital requirements against trading books, we should be less susceptible than before to arguments that we should not introduce specific regulations because they might tend to reduce market liquidity in some specific category of trading. To sum up, therefore, we do need new economic thinking. But even more importantly, I think we need to ensure that public policy debate is not constrained by acceptance of an oversimplified version of one strain in economic thinking, but opening open to the great variety of insights which good economics has always given us. Thank you very much.